King Kong. The of the world. Nightmare of the Silver Screen. These guys are gonna come in and get us during the night. They have been attacked by a gorilla on more than one occasion. When a giant ape did exist. Gigantopithecus was the largest ape that ever lived. I just saw something very peculiar. And many believe still lives on. It's more of what I have seen. Okay. You're gonna have to prove to me otherwise that they don't exist. Scientists searching for answers. They can't possibly be making this up. To a generation's old mystery. I don't know what it is that's out there, but it sure got their attention, I'll tell you that, and mine. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. The tops of thick spruce trees and tall bamboo part wide as this giant ape passes. Huge, fresh tracks will serve warning to any human that something large is near and potentially dangerous. Its terrifying screams echo through the ancient Asian forests, letting every living creature know the real king is near. Gigantopithecus was the largest ape that ever lived. It truly was the real King Kong. These hairy giants are no myth, and they had no equal in weight or height. This primate cast a massive shadow on the forest floor throughout Southeast Asia. Here it thrived for nearly six million years before most likely meeting its demise just a few hundred thousand years ago. A mere blink of an eye in primate history. We have the evidence because we have the teeth and jaws and they show that Gigantopithecus really lived. He was a King Kong to people who lived a half a million years ago. Russ Shahan is a paleoanthropologist from the Laboratory of Biological Anthropology at the University of Iowa. He is one of the few scientists studying the mammoth-sized prehistoric King Kong. To understand how big Giganto really was, we can say that when Giganto was standing on its hind limbs, it would have come up to the eaves of a one-story house. We will look at the mystery surrounding what scientists have named Gigantopithecus, Latin for gigantic ape, the real life King Kong. In fact, one could say that of all the primates known, this is the most mysterious. The reason for this is we only have three jaws and about 1,100 isolated teeth. Yet from that, we know this is the largest ape that ever lived and we also know it's the only ape to go extinct in the Pleistocene. Dr. Jack Rink, a geochronologist at McMaster University in Toronto, Canada, shares Shahan's interest in Giganto and wants to learn more. Giganto must have been an amazing creature because it had teeth three times as large as human molars. And so that got me to thinking, I wonder if it's related in any way to some of the mythical giant apes that have been reported in northern parts of the world that added to my excitement about trying to determine the age of it most scientists believe giganto lived out its reign and then suddenly for no apparent reason died out but other scientists believe giganto or a living relic could still survive today just a tremendous number of sightings John Majinski is a bighorn sheep expert and unquestionably knows the wilderness and every native animal living in the western United States. He now wants to unravel the mystery surrounding these unfamiliar and massive apes. There's an abundance of, of really good solid information now backed by genetics, uh, DNA studies that um, these animals we consider residents of North America actually arrived here from Asia over a land bridge connecting Siberia and Alaska. I don't think there's any question about that information now. In several different geologic times, these animals have found a way to migrate from Asia to North America and back again. Majinski believes Giganto may be connected to modern mystery ape sightings like Bigfoot and Yeti. This is 
probably remnants of a species that I think personally uh, may be Gigantopithecus or some relative of Gigantopithecus. And Mayanjinsky is not alone. The fact that there are sightings of a, of a corollary to a giant ape similar to what we uh, occur or what we encounter here in North America, in Asia as well, strikes me as very interesting because there are many aspects of the environments shared by these two continents. But this giganto expert does not agree. In my opinion, Gigantopithecus has no connection with any of the mystery ape sightings around the world. Gigantopithecus was a real ape that lived in the Pleistocene of tropical Asia. Despite these polarized views, scientists agree visions of large apes hit a primordial chord in many humans. The reasons for this are not so obvious. Physically, great apes or King Kong are very scary to us because they look like us. We can look into their eyes and we're wondering, what are they thinking? Are they as intelligent as us? Can they set up a trap for us that other animals wouldn't do? Equally fascinating is if everybody around the world is seeing these creatures and they don't exist. What does that mean? Is it mass hysteria? I think we're going to have to study that. And either side of this question is fascinating. Stories of giant unknown apes have been around for centuries. And in 1933, this legend came to life on the silver screen. They look like us. He's a bad guy. He is ferocious, and that's frightening. Well, I think one of the biggest parts of the fear with Kong, or any giant gorilla, as far as that goes, is he might not kill you right away, but he might carry you off. He might carry your girlfriend off, your wife off, your grandfather, anybody. He could carry you off and put it in a put him in a cave somewhere and save you for later. It's a scary thing to think. Now, this thing might just stomp on me right now and kill me, but he might pick me up and I have to be with him for days or weeks. And that's really terrifying and not knowing what's going to happen. You have no idea. And that's a fear I think we all have today. It's still with us. On rare occasions, gorillas have grabbed humans and dragged them away. It happened to this man, Esteban Sarmiento, from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Yeah, I have been. I guess I have been attacked by a gorilla. In 1994, I was studying gorillas and I went into a group of gorillas. It was a relatively large group with 20 animals. Usually the, the gorilla is hiding from you, so sometimes he's behind a bush, behind a tree, and sometimes he covers the foliage over his body. His face, which is normally, at least in Western gorilla, it's black in color, becomes sort of purple because the blood rushes to, to his face. Lips pull back so you can see his teeth. While the older animal was relatively docile, the younger animals were more aggressive. And three of them charged me. One of the smallest of them came, came at me and bit me on the back. And he grabbed me by the foot and he tried to drag me. He just grabbed my thigh like it was a chicken and tried to get a bite out of it. I was never worried because I always had in the back of my mind that they don't eat me. Sort of got up and walked away. Like a modern day boogeyman, Aboriginal cultures tell stories of apes kidnapping their women and children. With those wood print things they made years ago where you see a gorilla is running off with a whole tribe of, of people and stuff like that. I mean, that's the way they used to think. They were horrible big things. North American native cultures also tell stories of giant apes. One of the things that, as an archaeologist, solidifies that this is a real animal is that Native Americans have literally a hundred names, and I'm still discovering them, for this, this animal, and it is such as Stimaha, Oma, Sasquatch, Skookum, there's many, many names. And as an archaeologist, as a scientist, it doesn't make sense to me that tribes would give names to imaginary creatures. Whether real or imaginary, these creatures all share traits that are consistent with each other, such as muscular build, human-like face, five-toed feet, and behavior traits that include shyness, fear of humans, nocturnal habits, screaming, rock-throwing, 
and odd descriptors like foul, musty like smell. Some of these traits are also consistent with gorillas. They have an apocrine gland. It's associated often with a smell, as we also find in great apes. It was not long ago that the scientific world thought that the mountain apes of Africa were just a myth. We know exists the gorilla that we didn't find. It was thought to be a myth up until I think what was it, 1915, somewhere in there, the early part of the last century. Uh, people were coming out of the jungle saying there's a big man-like thing wandering around in there. Nobody would believe it. Proof the mystery apes exist may also be found in the pattern of sightings. There's also consistent some of the reports of these mysterious apes in that they, they occur seasonally in specific areas, year in and year out. So during one part of the year, the spring, we might find them at point B, and the other part of the year, the summer, we might find them in point A, and this is consistent from year to year. Stories of giant ape-like creatures roaming the remote forests around the world have been reported for centuries. But just what do these sightings mean? Dr. Briggs Hall is a Washington State wildlife veterinarian and has some theories. I've taken some phone calls from some people that clearly had had some kind of uh, uh, earth-shaking experience. And uh, if the news came out tomorrow that uh, we had, in fact, documented for sure the presence of a great ape in Washington, Washington, I wouldn't be particularly shocked. I can personally believe that if there was a large ape, he could hide there uh, if he was very clever and uh, if he was nocturnal. I can believe that. I don't think that there is any valid scientific basis for any of the mystery ape sightings. I think these are other animals or there are hallucinations of the people who are reporting them. It is certainly not primordial fear or the many reports of mysterious apes that got Rush Shahan hooked on giant apes. He is about to embark on a quest that may finally provide answers to how Giganto lived and where it fit in the evolutionary tree of life. We can try to figure out the position of Gigantopithecus in the primate family tree from fossils, but we only get an approximate position of where it fits in. A much better way would be to analyze its ancient DNA or its ancient protein structure. Today, Shahan is trying to make his dream come true. Our research in China will concentrate in the province of Guangxi. His journey takes him from the cornfields of Iowa to the bustling back streets of Nanning, China, in search of what the Chinese call dragon bones, their name for any fossil they grind into medicine. It is here in 1935, in one of these apothecary shops, that remnants of this giant ape are first discovered by a now deceased German paleoanthropologist. The discovery of, of Gigantopithecus happened in a very unconventional way. Ralph von Kuningswald learned that the bones of extinct mammals could be found in apothecary shops all over Asia. The Chinese thought they had medicinal properties, curing everything from backache to sexual impotence. Von Kuningswald decided to track down and look at the fossils in these apothecary shops. He found a very large molar of a primate. He knew that it was larger than any ape that ever lived. Today we arrived in Nanning, Guangxi, on the first leg of our tour of the Gigantopithecus bearing sites of southern China. I'm really anxious to solve the mystery of the age of these various Gigantopithecus cave sites. Now with Jack Rink's new method of ESR, we can finally determine how old they are, which will tell us a lot about the evolution of Gigantopithecus in southern China. We can reconstruct how much radiation the tooth got while it was buried, and we can compare that to the amount of radiation the teeth got while they were in the ground. And from that, we can find out how long this radiation was occurring during the burial time of the tooth. But Rink and Shahan are not the only scientists on a quest. Dr. Jeff Meldrum from Idaho State University and wildlife consultant John Mayanchinsky 
have assembled a group of scientists in search of answers to the many modern-day sightings. It's interesting that, uh, that these have, have almost, uh, without exception, occurred in areas where suitable habitat and environments for these, uh, these species exist. I met up with a cluster of individuals who shared a scientific background and said, if we don't look into this, we're um, really not very good scientists. Mayanchinsky has another reason to explore this mystery. In 1973, he had an encounter of his own. This time the shadow went over the top of the tent, an indentation appeared on the side of the tent, and I decided to hit it. King Kong was a Hollywood creation, but a giant ape called Gigantopithecus blackie existed 100,000 years ago. A small but growing number of scientists and researchers believe it may live on. Though no hard evidence points to a surviving ape species in North America, the North Cascades seem to meet the basic requirements of good ape habitat. Dr. Jeff Meldrum and wildlife consultant John Mayanchinsky want to prove it. Our primary goal on this particular expedition is to obtain photographic and hopefully DNA evidence uh, in the form of hair, scat. Common thread would, would be a good term to explain what we're looking for between, uh, say, bear habitat and primate habitat in the Northwest. The North American Ape Project, spearheaded by Dr. Jeff Meldrum, has assembled a team of scientists in search of answers. We're also doing a lot of survey work to, to uh, identify trace evidence in the form of footprints, trackways, that would indicate the presence of an animal here in the region. It means if we can find scat, we can learn a lot about what this animal eats, which will also give us the habitat information we need to know seasonality of distribution and perhaps requirements. There's this tendency for the sightings to occur along um, major water courses. Some need for these animals are hanging out around water. John Mayanchinsky is a respected wildlife consultant and is part of the North American Ape Project. For Mayanchinsky, it is personal. Summer of 1972, I was working on bighorn sheep research in the Wind River Mountains. And I had a camp set up. There had been a bacon stain from a box of bacon that had melted in high temperatures during the day and into the nylon of this tent. I kind of was anticipating the possibility of a bear nosing around the tent, and sure enough, here comes the bear. And started sticking his nose into the tent. I was fully convinced this was a bear when it first started to indent the nylon. Generally, black bears are animals that are afraid of people and afraid of surprises, so I uh, took the, my hand and I whapped it in the nose with the back of my fingers, what I thought was its nose. And then it came back again and did the same thing, nosed its way into the part of the tent where the bacon stain was. And I did the same thing. I, I whapped it with the back of my hand. This time I hit something very hard, like a rock instead of a nose, and uh, I think I hit a kneecap. Came back a third time. This time the shadow went over the top of the tent. I, by now I had my handgun out. I was prepared for an aggressive bear. But instead, uh, I saw the shadow come over the top of the front of my tent, which very definitely was hand, not a bear paw. The hand, however, was about two or three times the size of mine. And I crawled out in front and built fire. I could still hear this thing breathing in the dog hair pine. It was probably 40 feet away. I uh, just wanted to see it coming in the firelight. And I just started to nod off and was awakened by the sound of something hitting the ground. And then I heard the sound again, and it was a pine cone. And for the next 45 minutes to an hour, whatever was in there threw pine cones at me. And this convinced me that this was not a bear. It is stories like Mayanchinsky's that drives Jeff Meldrum's search for answers. So here's the point of the uh, bridge washout. 
The team has unanimously agreed the best research area is on the opposite side of the raging Seattle River, located 80 miles northeast of Seattle, Washington. Which would allow us to explore all these roads on this side of the river. This country is incredibly difficult to get through, and, and like most animals in that kind of terrain, they'll utilize trails where they find them. The use of horses may increase the odds of a surprise encounter. Years ago, a hundred year flood had come through here and eroded these embankments. So what we've done is we've lessened the angle. Now we're gonna take our horses down the embankment and try and cross the river. <clears throat> There's a lot of sweepers where if you get in the water and you get carried away, you're gonna go under. I bet you're kind of scared, aren't you? He'll be all right. He'll go after him. He's ready. There go slow. Oh. It'd be real exciting to see how the whole area reverted back to nature. For the past three years, I haven't been able to go over there, and I've been going over there for the last 20. While Meldrum starts his hunt for living giant apes, Dr. Russell Shahan continues his treasure hunt for dead ones. He's at his favorite haunt in China, an opening in the earth, high off the ground in a limestone spire, eerily jutting out of the ground in this picturesque Chinese countryside. At this site in 1965, Chinese scientists found 12 teeth of Gigantopithecus. The teeth of Gigantopithecus from this site are larger than any of the other Gigantopithecus teeth known. We have to realize that Gigantopithecus was not living in these caves. Rather, the teeth and bones of Gigantopithecus washed into the cave or were dragged into the cave by porcupines. His colleague, Jack Rink, a geochronologist from Toronto, Canada's McMaster University, is at another cave and is using an electron spin resonance meter to date what is believed to be the youngest cave containing giganto fossils. The exact age of the underground repository will be revealed at the university's nuclear lab. We are the pioneers of the electron spin resonance dating method. We have experience in many sites throughout the world doing electron spin resonance dating. And we have a group of people here that are interested in pushing archaeological science. Together, Shahan and Rink hope to answer the questions, how old is Giganto? How did it live? And who or what is it related to? While scientists know Giganto lived in Asia, there are many reports of ape-like creatures elsewhere. In 1982, on a remote roadway near Whitehall, New York, police officer Dan Gordon had an encounter with a creature resembling descriptions of Giganto. I don't mind being told I may have mistaken something. I can understand that, but I do not want to be called a liar. 23 years ago, we're on duty for the Whitehall Police Department. My partner and I were checking out part of the village that isn't normally traveled. We uh, rounded a corner. That's when this thing crossed in front of us. I knew I had to get the car down and try to confirm what I saw. I immediately grabbed my flashlight jumped out of the car, and I asked my partner if he was coming. He said he, was, he wasn't going anywhere. Followed it for 30, 40 feet. That's when I stopped. I could hear the brush rustling. That was some bear, wasn't it? That was no bear. It was no bear. And I knew it was no bear. I know what I saw. All around the world, thousands of reports describe a similar six to 11 foot tall, hairy, upright, bipedal ape. These reports have largely been ignored by the scientific community until now. The North American Ape Project expedition is now in its third day and horse wrangler Mark Peterson is deeply concerned with the logistics. You can't get in by ATV or vehicle. So we have to get the horses across some raging rivers. The big round boulders are tough because they keep moving with the water. One misstep could compromise the expedition. The first ever academically funded scientific expedition called the North American Ape Project sets out to gather data 
that will either support or dispel the theory that a large King Kong-like primate could live in North America. It will record 24-7. We can come back later and download that data and review it and uh, analyze it. The team chose a research site in the North Cascade Mountains of Washington. Storm flood waters washed out all the bridges years ago, protecting the area from human traffic. To get there, they must first cross the raging Seattle River. Keep going. The horses were stumbling trying to get their feet under them. Those big round boulders are tough because they keep moving with the water. That was a tense moment. They did pretty well. Pulled out of it. Now we're on the wild side of the river. I wish him luck. Numerous past sightings came from people on horseback. One explanation might be that horses mask human sound and scent, and apes have no fear of horses, making a chance encounter more likely. So how long is that battery going to last in that hack cam? Before the river closed the area off, loggers and hikers regularly reported seeing large apes. So Mark installs a miniature camera in what he thinks is the perfect spot, in his hat. The camera is just a small little one millimeter fiber optic that if we put it in there properly, it'll see exactly what I see as I'm on horseback. Here, they hope to have their own chance encounter, like the account Dr. Briggs Hall recalled of a mystery ape. Hall, a wildlife veterinarian for Washington State, is responsible for the welfare of wildlife in the region. The receptionist buzzed me and says, Dr. Hall, I think you should take this call. So I picked up the phone and introduced myself, and this very agitated, agitated voice came on the line. He says, you're not going to believe me. I am not crazy. I know what I saw. And so I took a minute to get him calmed down, and I said, tell me what, what you saw. He told me that he and his girlfriend were hiking, and they had come to a spot uh, along the trail where there was a shaft of light coming down through, and they said, well, this is a warm place to sit down and eat our lunch. He says, as we were sitting there, we became aware of some kind of an animal coming down through the trees along the creek. And he says, I could just see this brown thing kind of above the bushes every so often. And as it got closer, it came to a spot where there was kind of a clearing, and he said it stepped out, and it was a large, upright beast standing on two feet with another animal on its shoulder. He says the minute it saw us, it turned and crossed the creek in about two strides and was gone. He had clearly, clearly seen something that was out of the ordinary. Dr. Hall is not the only government official to believe in the possibility of a North American ape. But I had a similar experience. Teddy Roosevelt, the 26th U.S. president, was an avid big game hunter. In 1890, he experienced something in the Cascade Mountains of Washington that he would talk about for years. This account is taken from his diary. <laughs> I looked at him quite firmly and I said, yes, yes, I can do one of two things. Either I can be president of the United States or I can control Alice, but I cannot do both. <laughs> Teddy loves to tell stories of his outdoor adventures, especially of his encounter with an unknown creature. Let's sit down and take a break, and I'll, I'll tell you one. Dad, so I believe that you are the Jonah between the two of us. It was a hunting trip. A companion and I were in Washington. We had come into an area where the natives had said there was much superstition about something out there deep into the woods, but <laughs> we bullied the, uh, the guide to bring us in. After all, we were the great hunters. <laughs> Well, we did not find any game, or even signs of game. The hunting trip was nearly worthless. As we turned in that night and were sitting along the campfire, all of a sudden we were startled and greeted by a great, low, rumbling roar. Unlike any bear or beast I have ever heard before. It sounds menacing. Perhaps there is more than one. 
I have never heard that kind of sound come from any game or woodland animal, but it was not native. It was not anything that I have heard before or since. This is a night we shall remember. And I do know my wilderness sounds, but I shall never forget it. More recently, in 1988, another government official had an encounter. Roger Blaine, a retired National Park Ranger, tells his story for the first time. I observed what I thought was an individual stepping out of the wood line onto the, the side of the road. And as I watched him, something about him seemed peculiar, besides the fact that he was a very large man. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away in China, Shahan and Rink have gathered the data they need to determine the time of Giganto's extinction and whether DNA extraction will be possible from the fossilized tooth. Paleoanthropologist Russell Shahan is in China, near Nanning, Guangxi, one possible home of the real King Kong, Giganto, a monstrous ape standing over 10 feet tall. Here, Shihan is on a mission to determine the exact age of the caves and Giganto. Shihan hopes fossilized teeth will provide DNA, genetic code preserved by the tooth enamel. The porcupines have eaten away all of the bones of Gigantopithecus. They've eaten away all the roots of the teeth and, and that only the massive part of the lower jaw, that is very thick, hard bone, remains. Porcupines lived alongside Giganto, and like their modern-day relatives, ate bones for calcium and other minerals. Most argue that the teeth of Gigantopithecus are too old to extract DNA, but new techniques that may be useful in that regard. In another cave near Shahan, geochronologist Jack Rink has hit pay dirt. He has found other mammal teeth in the same sediment layer where giganto teeth were excavated by the Chinese in 1970. If he can determine the age of the mammal teeth, the age of giganto will also be revealed. So we're going to take this back to the laboratory, grind up this tooth enamel, measure the magnetic resonance signal inside the tooth, and that'll tell us how much radiation dose the tooth got. Rink makes the long journey to Toronto, where he will start the tedious multi-step aging process using nuclear equipment. While Shahan and Rink believe Giganto died out during the Pleistocene era, National Forest Ranger Roger Blaine is not so sure. Over the scanner, I heard that a particular road uh, was opening uh, at five o'clock, and it had been closed for two years because of a washed out bridge. So I decided to deviate a bit and go home that way because no one had driven through there in quite some time and I wanted to see the new bridge. So as I was driving down the road, I observed what I thought was an individual stepping out of the wood line onto the, uh, the side of the road. And as I watched him, something about him seemed peculiar besides the fact that he was a very large man. And he walked across the road abruptly and into the bushes on the other side. The manner in which he walked was a bit odd. And then when he got to the far side of the road, he reached up and grabbed uh, the remainder of a, a little tree trunk there, and kind of pulled and jumped at the same time and cleared a six to eight foot bank. I expected to see him on the side of the road in the vegetation, and he wasn't there. That could only have meant that he was attempting to hide for some reason. And the hair stood up on the back of my neck. Well, I just saw something very peculiar. I don't know what the devil I saw. Credible eyewitness accounts like Roger Blaine's fuel the mystery John Mianchinsky and Dr. Jeff Meldrum hope to solve. They are heading up the world's first academically funded North American ape expedition to look for what they say could be a living relative of Giganto. 
we should believe that probably something like Gigantopithecus had been here. We don't want anything else to get it. It's got to go up right next to this thing. Oh, way up there, huh? Mayanchinsky is also looking for DNA and is setting snag traps hung above the height of known forest animals to collect hair samples. So if we get hair, we know it's pretty much from not any known species. That should be about 12 feet off the ground. Looks good. The snags are hidden in lichen, a local flora, that might be more than just camouflage. Mayanchinsky suspects lichen could also be a food source for these primates. Briarius pseudofusescens, mountain horsehair lichen. And look, it's all through the country where we've had sightings of the North American ape. Each year, hundreds of people report similar sightings of large, unknown, ape-like creatures, furthering the legend and fueling the search. Camouflage camera traps are also deployed, not in the woods, but in the eroded boulder-filled riverbed, so they look like rocks. This is the camera, like a lipstick camera. Maybe we'll get some animals walking by tonight. Okay, I'm gonna go test it now on the sandbar, see how it works, see how it looks. Sightings of ape-like creatures are commonly reported off trails near water. Looks nice, we got a good view. Dr. Shahan's next stop is Frankfurt, Germany, to retrieve the actual giganto teeth von Königswald found in China in 1935. He plans to take them to Leipzig for the ultimate CSI on Giganto. The problem with DNA extraction is really related to how old the Gigantopithecus teeth are. Shahan is not 100% positive the German museum will actually go along with his plans. Extracting DNA could destroy these rare fossils. Wow, look at all those. Yeah, so here's the collection of von Königswald. Let's go over there. Dr. Russell Shahan is in Frankfurt, Germany at the Senckenberg Museum anxiously waiting to see the original giganto fossils first discovered in China in 1935. This museum contains the only collection of Gigantopithecus teeth outside of China. Dr. Shahan hopes the giganto teeth will yield DNA, definitively placing giganto on the primate evolutionary tree. May I introduce you? Hi, Russ. It's a pleasure to meet you. Very nice to meet you. The VK collection is down there. Let's go. He has plans for the ancient remains of the real King Kong tooth. Wow, look at all those. Yeah, so here's the collection of von Königswald, and here are the single teeth. Shahan must first obtain permission from Dr. Otmar Kolmer, paleoanthropologist and for the moment keeper of the fossil. But first they need to determine whether the teeth are likely candidates to provide DNA. So, you see, oh, and here's the teeth. teeth. Yes. If they are more than 100,000 years old, the genetic material is likely useless. Yes, the holotype. This is the holotype of Gigantopithecus blackie. Yeah. Very nice. That's where it all started. Shahan looks to Dr. Rink's dating work to provide the actual age of Giganto. 
This instrument in front of us is a thermal ionization mass spectrometer, and we use this device for the, the back end stage of electron spin resonance dating. As we give it more radiation dose, the signal grows from a small signal to progressively larger and larger and larger, and that's how we determine the age. Another test that may reveal even more data is a micro CT scan. The inside out view of Giganto's molar could provide clues to Giganto's behavior and possible relatives. My job, what I've been doing, is putting those images together so we can see a virtual model of the tooth. This test is set to be done at the Max Planck Dental Histology Lab in Leipzig, Germany. But first, Shahan must get permission. The teeth are in the box, let's close it. So, Elke, here is the box. Oh. These giant ape fossils have not left the museum in over 50 years. Shahan knows this is a chance of a lifetime. Before the DNA tests can begin, Shahan needs answers from Dr. Rink's dating work on the age of the teeth. We worked in five different caves. The, the two most important ones were establishing the oldest giganto fossils, which is, was at a site called Liu Cheng in the northern part of the study area, where we got an age of about a million years, plus or minus 100,000 years. The other site that was important is a place called Wu Ming, which is in the southern part of the study area, closer to Vietnam. While the Wu Ming site did provide younger fossils, they are found to be 300,000 years old, too old to yield DNA. Shahan is disappointed. DNA extraction is no longer an option. The CT scan now becomes far more important. It could still give Shahan information on the evolutionary position of Gigantopithecus and the diet of this extinct ape. If I was to measure it in millimeters, Gigantopithecus would have the thickest enamel of any primate that we've looked at. In the final analysis, the thickness of the enamel raises as many questions as it answers. The CT scan does reveal that the prehistoric tooth is similar in construction to modern apes and that Giganto likely shared a similar diet, supporting Shahan's theory that Giganto was probably an orangutan relative. However, other scientists, like Jeff Meldrum, believe the tooth forensics clearly shows Giganto's diet was not the same. Surprisingly, Gigantopithecus was a generalist, a generalized omnivore, uh, and uh, the pattern of uh, tooth wear was most similar to that of a chimpanzee, not even that of a gorilla, of a large-bodied ape like a gorilla. Dr. Meldrum and his team of researchers on the North American Ape Project set out to determine whether there is sufficient food sources to support a 500-plus pound primate and to find physical evidence of a possible creature. The most successful things we accomplished was uh, simply addressing this perennial objection that there isn't enough for a large omnivorous primate to eat in a temperate forest. And our studies have, uh, have really shown that that just absolutely is not the case. We did have a, a very suggestive footprint measuring nearly 17 inches in length near the camp that uh, remains inconclusive but will, will bear further scrutiny. And what of the eyewitness sightings? Like Whitehall, New York police officer Dan Gordon's encounter in 1982. Did you think it was human? No, I did not. Law enforcement sketch artist Carrie Parks has agreed to draw Gordon's creature and determine if he is credible. If I thought it was human, I would have had no reason to pull my revolver. I think he saw something large, hairy, and beyond his experience. While Shahan and Rink finally learned Giganto's age, they were disappointed they could not obtain DNA. Meldrum and Majachinsky believe there is now evidence that enough food exists to support a large primate in the wilds of the Pacific Northwest. And for eyewitnesses like Dan Gordon... I know what I saw. I believe he saw something. Nature's mystery continues, as does the legend of King Kong.